Okay, hello everybody. Um, we're back for part two of the Constitution. I'm going to go through this pretty quickly, so make sure that as you take notes, you pause it so you can make sure you get everything down. Um, we're going to start right away with where we left off. Remember, we left off with um, the last straw being Shay's Rebellion before enough people started to think that something needed to change. So we have actually two conventions. We have a First one in 1786 in Annapolis, Maryland, and only five states attended that first reform effort. Um, so they knew that wasn't enough. So what they ended up doing was um, calling for a full scale meeting in Philadelphia the next year. And what that will do is that will become the constitutional convention that we are now um, aware of that creates the constitution itself. Um, 12 states went to the Constitutional Convention. Rhode Island did not, and Rhode Island um, decides not to attend a lot of things because they kind of like it the way it is because everybody leaves them alone. Um, but uh, they will end up joining up later on. Um, and again, this uh, they meet for something that you could say this is the way it was supposed to be for the sole and express purpose of revising the articles. Well, that's not what they did. Um, and so it, while not quite illegal, because that's there, you can't say it's illegal, but what they did was instead of doing that, they ignored that because they knew revising was impossible. We talked about that the other day. Um, the, the revision takes all 13 states to make a, an amendment happen for the articles. So what they did was they wrote a, wrote a brand new governing document, and that's what becomes our Constitution. Now, before we get into some of the meat of it, let's figure out who the writers are. There were 55 delegates and, and knowing who they are, and that doesn't mean you know who their names were, it's, it's uh, what, where from the population did they come? And it should be of no surprise that they're going to be the economic and political elite because that's who's going to be able to do this. They're gonna have the knowledge to do it. They're gonna be able to attend. You know, A farmer from the back country is not gonna be able to attend this as a delegate. Um, so they're going to be the wealthy planters if they're in the south. They're going to be the lawyers and merchants, and that more than anything else in the north or in the coastal cities. Um, and they're going to be people who had practical political political experience for the most part. The vast majority of them had been um, perhaps uh, delegates to the to the um, to the government under the Articles of Confederation. They've been uh, politicians in their own state, in their own legislatures, maybe even as far back as the. Um, um, Continental Congress, or even before that, some of the older ones might have even been um, in in the legislatures uh, while they were still under English rule. So, excuse me, they had they had experience. Most of them, again, are going to be coastal and urban. The majority of the country was not, but this is where the um, economic and political elite reside, except for some or perhaps some of the wealthy planters who had plantations inland, but they probably had houses in the urban areas as well. Um, and the problem they're going to have is how are they going to devise a government strong enough to preserve order, but not strong enough that it's going to threaten liberty? And that's going to be the real problem. And that's a problem we still struggle with today when we talk about the scope of government and how or what government should do. This is the same idea that they're thinking back then. What should government do? Um, so. The Constitution is going to deal with three difficult issues, two of which we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about equality. And when we say equality, we're generally meaning equality in representation. Um, we'll talk a little bit about slavery as well in there, but we're generally talking about equality in representation. We're going to talk about um, the economic issues. And we talked, we did that last, last, uh, last lecture where we talked about the fact that um, um, the states were waging economic war against each other. The national government couldn't regulate commerce and things like that. And then the, later on in the next one, we're going to talk about how they deal with individual rights. So we'll deal with the first two, equality and economics today. And so we'll start with equality. And again, like I said, it's going to be equality and representation. And the issue, of course, is when we say that is how are the states going to be represented? And we're going to have two competing plans in the end. The New Jersey plan will be the first one, and that's going to be the idea that there's going to be a one house or a unicameral legislature with equal representation um, in Congress. Each state gets the same amount, whatever that amount was, 10, 5, whatever. Georgia gets what Georgia say gets 10, and New York gets 10, and Virginia gets 10. 
And the idea here, the question is who favors this idea and who favors this idea because they end up with disproportionate power are going to be the small states. When we say small states, we mean small states by population. The other plan is called the Virginia plan, and you need to know the basics of each of these. The Virginia plan is going to say, no, we need to do the states based on their share of population. Um, and that means the more population you have, the more representatives you have. And again, who favors that idea? It's going to be the opposite. The large populated states are going to favor this plan. And it actually had a, a bicameral legislature, two houses, but each of them, if it called the House and the Senate, each of them had, had uh, representation based on population. So what they're going to do is compromise um, in order to get things done. Of course, you need to do that. So you end up with, it's called the Connecticut Compromise or the Great Compromise. Um, either way, you need to know that if you say Connecticut Compromise, it means the Great Compromise. And that's laid out in Article 1. And I'm going to put a copy of the Constitution in the um, Documents folder. Um, and when we refer to it a little bit later today, I'm going to ask you to take a look at those as we go through. So number one, representation based on population in the House. So they get the Virginia plan goes into effect in the House. However, the New Jersey plan idea goes into effect in the Senate. So it's going to be equal representation in the Senate. In our case, every state gets two. So who has more power in this? Um, it's, it's an interesting thing to look at. The small states actually have more power, and here's why. Number one, equal representation in the Senate gives small states more power. And when you say more power, that means, so I'll give you an example, that means more um, or less people per senator. So if you look at this, and I know it's hard to read there, um, in modern day Wyoming residents, Wyoming has a population of less than a million people. They have two senators. California has um, 40 million people and they have two senators. So each person in Wyoming, if you want to look at it that way, divided up per senator, might have disproportionate power. Um, and on the other, for the other part of this, and this is the real reason why um, small states have more power, is key issues only come to the Senate. When we look later on in Unit 2, we'll talk about those. So things like um, the, uh, the uh, voting on judges, voting on treaties, um, voting on um, presidential appointments, all of those particular things are something the Senate and only the Senate does. So that, that's another reason why small states have more power. Okay, slavery, another issue that has to deal with equality. Um, and we, we know this, we did the Declaration of Independence independence analysis. There's obvious contradictions with the Declaration of Independence, and there's no getting around that. Um, all men created equal, what does that really mean? So they're going to deal with this issue, but slavery is not going to be mentioned. And why is there? The why is because the southern states would not allow it, and we needed everybody to agree on this new or a good portion of everybody to agree on these things. And the Senate and the, the southern states were just going to walk out if slavery was dealt with head on. So the biggest issue, again, is how they're going to count. And we know that representation in the House is based on population. So those southern states where they had large numbers of slaves wanted them to count for normal population, but they didn't want them to count for taxation. And what we have to understand is taxation was different back then. There was the um, income tax, which we have now, was not something that wasn't constitutional, something they didn't want to do. Um, so... Um, taxation was based on, on proportion of the population that was going to be assigned. So larger states are going to pay more as far as population goes. So southern states didn't want to deal with that. So they wanted it one way. They wanted to have their cake and eat it too. Count them as population, but not as taxation. The northern states did the opposite. They said, no, you can't count them for representation at all. However, you absolutely have to count them for taxation. So they would have to pony up more money. So both sides were sort of, uh, were sort of taking the opposite end of this. So what did they do? Of course, they compromised. And they're going to compromise, and we call it, it's one of the major compromises, it's the three-fifths compromise. So representative, representation and taxation would be based on taking the total number of slaves, multiplying that, multiplying that by three-fifths, and that's the number. So they compromised. So they did have to pay taxes on, on some of them, and they got to use some of them as representation. So something the southern states could deal with and the northern states could deal with. So then, again, they something they had to do. Um, also, slavery was dealt with another way. 
Again, the word is not going to appear, but Congress was allowed in the Constitution to um, limit the importation of slaves in the future. Um, and the wording in the, in the document says they cannot deal with it until 1808, until 20 years had passed. And if you did not know, in 1808, the first chance they got, Congress did ban the importation of slaves. So starting in 1808, it was illegal to import slaves into the United States. That doesn't make slavery illegal because slavery still existed, but you couldn't import anymore. And so it's a small step on the way to the long, long way to getting to the Civil War and dealing with the issue um, finally and for good. In addition to that, there's also going to be the idea of political equality. And what we mean by that is some wanted universal male suffrage and others wanted only those with property interests. So what they did here was effectively punt. Um, so the solution they came up with is let each state decide on its own. So that's the solution to political equality. Um, and essentially, that's still the way it is, um, except for the things that they can't violate, like age and, and sex now and things like that that are changed with various amendments. OK, let's talk about the economic issues. I'm going to try to fly through this so I can fit it into the time frame. State tariffs, uh, state tariffs, tariff wars were going on against each other. We talked about that last time. Paper money was worthless. And Congress had problems raising money. That's that tax. They couldn't have tax. So they have all of those particular problems um, going on at the same time. So they're going to try to fix them. And so Article 1, Section 8, one of the most important parts of the Constitution, because it lays out the powers of the national government, a uh, significant number of those deal with economics. The, the ability to levy taxes, the ability to pay debts, the ability to borrow money, um, coin and regulate money, to regulate interstate and foreign commerce. Um, all of those things we talked about as problems. They're going to control bankruptcy. They're going to punish piracy. All these things are economic issues. You're going to be able to punish counterfeiting and standardize weights and measures, do post offices and post roads, and protect copyrights and patents. All of those things are in um, the Constitution as far as economic power. In addition, there are things the states cannot do. So go ahead and mark these up when you get a chance. States cannot impair contracts if you look in Article 1, Section 10. States cannot coin money or issue paper money. So there's only be one currency in the United States. That should solve some problems. The states can't tax imports or exports from other states or abroad, so they can't wage economic war against each other. And as sad as it is, runaway slaves was an economic issue, and states cannot free runaway slaves. Other things. The new government will assume the national debt. There was a debt left over from the Articles of Confederation government, and this new government will assume that debt and pay it. There's a guarantee of a Republican form of government to the states. That's really an economic issue as well. So as long as, as well as a political issue. So the guarantee of this Republican form, states have to have a Republican or representation or representative form of government. States have to respect other states' civil judgments and contracts. That's Article 4, Section 1. So if you are married in one state, you're married in another state. If you're divorced in one state, you're divorced in another state. If you have a contract in Georgia, you can't go to South Carolina and then say, ha, I don't have to pay it. You still have to pay that because states can't impair those contracts. And some of these things had been done in the past. So they're, they're trying to make things equal among the states so the same part types of things happen. And uh, that's going to be the end for today. Uh, we'll pick up with part three again later on, but we've got uh, we've got more to do. Um, you've got another assignment to do here this week as well, of the Articles Confederation. So make sure you get these notes in. Um, go ahead and go through them fully, clearly. Make sure you have them down, and then we'll move on, and we'll see you next time. Thanks.